India Limited, Mr. Akshay Mundra, CFO of Vodafone Idea Limited, along with other key members of the senior management on this call. I want to thank the management team on behalf of all participants for taking valuable time to be with us. Given that the senior management is on this conference call, participants are requested to focus on the key strategic and important questions to make sure that we make good use of the senior management's time. I must remind you that the discussion on today's call may include certain forward-looking statements and must be viewed, therefore, in conjunction with the risk that the company faces. With this, I hand the conference call over to Mr. Ravindar Takkar. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Nizam. On behalf of Vodafone Idea, I welcome all participants to this earnings call. On Saturday, our board of directors adopted the unaudited results for the quarter ending December 31st, 2020. A detailed press release, quarterly report, and unaudited financials have been uploaded on our website, and I hope you had a chance to go through the same. As usual, I will start discussing our ongoing strategic initiatives along with operational highlights for the quarter. I will then head over to Akshay to share details on the company's financial performance. Our key strategic intent has always been to offer superior customer experience on both data and voice, which will help us drive better 4G additions and consequently improve revenues, profitability, cash flows, and our competitive position in the market. Let me now discuss the progress we have made on our various strategic initiatives. The most important initiative is our focused network investments. We continue to have a focused approach to investments, biased towards our profitable areas, to utilize our capex effectively while ensuring that we offer superior customer experience in these areas. We are driving incremental 4G investments in our 16 priority circles, which contribute 94% of our revenues and 86% of industry revenue. We continue to add 2G capacity to spectrum reforming in these areas. We continue to progressively upgrade our 3G network to 4G. While our overall broadband site count stood around 448,000, lower compared to Q2 FY21, due to closure of 3G sites, we added approximately 12,000 4G FTD sites, mainly through the farming of 2G, 3G spectrum to expand our 4G coverage and capacity. Our 4G coverage is just over 1 billion of Indian population. Our relentless pursuit to become the best 4G network in the country is reflected in our top rankings across various third-party reports on both data and voice. We Gigamet remains the fastest 4G network in the country for two consecutive quarters as per report. Based on PRAI's My Call Fact Data, we also had the best voice quality in the country for the last three months consecutively. This is not only providing a great experience for our customers, but also helping us drive stronger network perception, leading to better customer response in the market. While we are currently in the middle of our 4G CapEx cycle, we are deploying equipment which is 5G ready on both radio and core. We have already deployed and are using a range of 5G technologies such as massive MIMO, DSR, open RAN, cloudification of core, etc. We also have the largest edge cloud deployment in the country. While 5G ecosystem is still nascent, we are well prepared for 5G rollout as and when the ecosystem is ready. 
The second focus area is market initiatives to drive output improvement. While tariff hike remains critical to improve the overall industry health, we have also undertaken several market initiatives to improve ARPU with focus on driving 4G and UL plan penetrations. After the launch of our unified brand B, we have launched a very high decibel campaign to announce that B powered by Ethernet is the fastest 4G area on TV, digital, and outdoor media. We have also launched several digital campaigns in an IPL, which is a great opportunity to connect with customers, leading to strong engagement and brand affinity. This quarter, we also launched Weekend Data Rollover, an exclusive opposition to carry forward unused data from weekdays to weekends on all unlimited packs with daily data. Work on IDEA continues to aggressively focus on digitization of customer services across all touch points. We now have digital acquisition in more than 100 cities for both prepaid and postpaid, including same day doorstep delivery and digital KYC processes, service to our dedicated delivery partners as well as our own stores. The third focus area is business services and new fast growing segments. Business services remain one of our focus areas where we leverage our multi-year relationship with customers and global strength of Vodafone Group. These businesses continue to deliver growth by partnering with both large enterprises and SMEs in their digital transformation programs, which have accelerated during the pandemic. In new business stream, cloud services remain central to our growth strategy. We continue to maintain a clear leadership in IoT offerings, which has a potential to grow manifold in the near future. We extended our market leaderships in IoT in the connected vehicles segment with the launch of industry first IoT ESIM, the first GSMA certified multi profile EUICC ESIM in the market. It is a game-changing and differentiated solution for automotives and other industries as the multiple network profiles ease the deployment with simple OTA provisioning to reduce the overall cost of operations. Our IoT growth strategy is in strong alignment with evolving market needs of our customers. In our journey from telco to digital services there, we would be moving beyond IoT connectivity by offering end-to-end -end IoT solutions enabled by IoT partner ecosystem. The heritage of expertise and demonstrated success with our customers continue to be recognized by the industry with CIO Choice 2021 awards. The recognition bases an extensive Pan-India CIO referral voting process that spans across industry verticals and guided by nine member CIO advisory panel is for a range of our products and services. We were chosen as the preferred partner choice for telecom carrier mobile access for seventh year in a row. Manage mobility services, first time nomination and first win. Sit trunk for second consecutive time and internet of things for fourth time in a row. We are also awarded Frost and Sullivan India ICT Best Practice Award 2020 as the end-to-end -end connectivity service provider of the year. The next strategic initiative is driving partnerships and digital revenue streams. We continue to have several regional and global content partners. We recently added Loop Select and Fireworks to our extensive list of content partners, which continue to grow day by day. As stated many times, our strategy on partnership extends way beyond content. We have partnered with various e-commerce platforms, answered manufacturers, financial institutions, and BFC, among many others, to create value not only for the customers, but also for the company and its partners. As we plan for future, we are now focusing on our platform capabilities 
to offer a deeper integration with our partners for a differentiated experience, create monetization opportunities, and truly become an integrated digital service provider. As a big step in that direction, BIL has entered into strategic partnerships with key players in the area of learning and upskilling, health and welfare, and business health to offer benefits to the new age customers. The company has forged partnerships with Upgrad, Udemy, Pedagogy, Show.fit, 1MG, Mfine, Unimark, Tumblr, and Cisco, and plans to onboard more partners under each of these areas to enable the users to get exclusive offers from these players. We will help, this will help us drive more value for our customers and offer growth opportunities for these businesses. And lastly, we have made good progress on our cost optimization exercise. We targeted to achieve with these 40 billion of annualized OPEX savings by the end of this calendar year. Several of our initiatives are bearing fruition as are visible in the cost reduction across many of our OPEX line items. As of this quarter, we have already achieved approximately 50% of these targeted annualized cost savings. Now moving on to operation highlights for the quarter. Revenue for the quarter was rupees 108.9 billion, a growth of 1% quarter on quarter, aided by higher 4G additions this quarter. As mentioned in our press release, our focus on being the best 4G network and the launch of our unified brand V has started to reflect in our improving operating performance. With improving subscriber retention, the subscriber base was 269.8 million in Q3 FY21, a decline of only 2 million compared to over 8 million last quarter. Cross additions continue to improve as well as subscriber churn declined to 2.3% compared to 2.6 a quarter ago. At the end of the quarter, the 4G subscriber base stood at 109.7 million, an addition of 3.6 million 4G customers. We continue to see healthy traction in 4G UL net additions will remain a key focus area for us. Now a quick update on some other developments. On the AGR matter, following the judgment on September 1st, 2020, we had written to BOT to rework the preliminary demands adjusted for computational errors, admissible pass-through charges, and payments made but not considered while computing the demand. We are still awaiting response from the DOT, but in the meanwhile, we have filed a modification application in the Supreme Court, which is currently pending here. As the matter is subjudice, we will not be able to comment anything further. On Indus Hick, as you are aware, the merger of Indus and Infratel was completed in November 2020. The IL has sold its 11.15% stake for consideration of rupees 37.6 billion and has made a prepayment of rupees 24 billion to the merged tower entity, which will be adjusted in line with the terms of the agreement. On fundraising, our board has approved fundraise of rupees 250 billion to a mix of debt and equity. We are in discussions with potential investors, which are progressing well, and we expect to conclude this exercise soon. Lastly, spectrum auctions are expected to happen in March 2021. While we have submitted our application and will be participating in the auction, we will be unable to comment at this point on our auction strategy, spectrum renewal, or acquisition plan, given the sensitive nature of this information. With that, I hand over to Akshay, who will share the financial highlights of the quarter. Thanks, Ravinder. <clears throat> a very good afternoon to participants from India and a good morning or evening as applicable to overseas participants. And mentioned by Ravinder, during the quarter, we have seen improved gross additions, better customer retention, and higher 4G additions. 
Resultantly, revenue was up by 1% for the quarter to rupees 108.9 billion as against rupees 107.9 billion in Q2 FY21. Adjusted for end A's 116 impact, EBITDA was rupees 21.1 billion for the quarter, positively impacted by rupees 3.3 billion due to amortization of subscriber acquisition cost over the expected customer life. Additionally, EBITDA improved due to higher revenue as well as incremental OPEC savings on account of our cost optimization initiatives. We are working on various cost initiatives to drive further savings and target to reduce our annual operating cost by Rs. 40 billion over Q4 FY20 baseline by end of this calendar year. We have made good progress and on a run rate basis by the end of Q3 FY21, we have achieved approximately 50% of our target cost saving. Q3 FY21 CAPEX stood at Rs. 9.7 billion. Net debt was Rs. 1170.8 billion as at December 20, as against 1145.1 billion in September 20. Out of this, the debt to banks and financial institutions is Rs. 231.7 billion and the balance is owed to the government towards deferred spectrum payments. On AGR, as Ravinder mentioned in his remarks, we have approached Supreme Court requesting them to allow DOT to make corrections for manifest errors in DOT demands. As the matter is pending hearing, we currently continue to recognize AGR obligations based on the demand figure informed by DOT to the Supreme Court. With this, I hand over the call back to Lizanne and open the floor for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question may please press star in one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants request that you use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question key assembles. The first question is from the line of Kunal Vora from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity, sir. First question on tariffs. Uh, like what's stopping you from raising the tariffs? Uh, Airtel has clearly said that they are not going to initiate a tariff hike. So if you can share your thoughts on uh, what will trigger the tariff hike and if you can update us on the flow tariff, uh, anything which you are hearing from duty. That's question number one. So I'll just go through all the three questions and then I'll leave it. So second one, uh, on, can you share your thoughts on 2G services? Uh, how long do you expect these services to continue and at what level of revenue contribution you might consider switching, switching it off? And finally, on prepaid customers, uh, the, sorry, postpaid customers, the uh, number is still down about 10%. Uh, what's been the reason for this when Airtel is seeing healthy additions? And uh, if you can talk about the impact of MT, MTN, uh, like machine to machine, it's still uh, hurting, hurting the numbers. Uh, so that's it for my video. Okay. Um, thank you, Vinod. Uh, let me try and then uh, for some of the items, I'm going to ask uh, Akshay to jump in as well. I'm starting with your first question, Kunal, on the uh, on the tariff. Um, I think we've said it earlier, and I think everybody in the industry continues to say that the industry needs uh, tariff hub. Um, all players acknowledge that. Uh, it is common knowledge that services are being sold well below um, the cost of capital, uh, and the returns are abysmal, um, you know, in the industry. Now. Um, and then, the, and then your, your question was about flow pricing, which is also another way. So one way is to increase tariff hikes or increase the tariff, or uh, the other way is for the government to institute uh, flow pricing. Um, as you're aware that the regulator had uh, floated um, flow pricing uh, consultation, they are in the middle of that. Uh, the change in regulator, the chairman of the PRI changed in the middle in, uh, in September, just after the pandemic and things when started to open up. I understand that that um, review and, and, and work on that area is continuing. Um, and so either one of those two could be a way to uh, improve the health of the industry. 
Now, in regards to your comment about our plans, um, I think as you would hopefully uh, see and appreciate from where we are as a company since our brand launch um, in September, uh, we have started to gain momentum uh, and traction in the market. Not only have we launched this unified brand, but overall, so you would see that across traditions, we market are improving. Our 4G subscriber growth, UI subscriber growth is starting to grow, and the tags are becoming more stable. I can tell you our engagement with customers is improving significantly. And so overall, we see a lot of positive momentum that is starting to take place. And with our fundraising discussions that are going on, we see overall a positive trend within our company. Of course, um, we've also mentioned that we will not wait for anybody else to join, but we will also raise prices at the right time. And the right time will be when the right time is. Um, I can't tell you then exactly what it would be, partly because I think it will be a competitive issue as well. Um, but at the same time, how much, what time, and so on are things that we will decide um, at the right time in the, and, and what is the right opportunity to do it. But we are not waiting for anybody in particular to, um, uh, to raise tariffs. Then we believe that we are in the best position of the company to raise prices. And increase tariffs, which are much we will uh, take those uh, steps in action. Um, in regards to the to the 2G service, uh, I think this question has been asked before, but let me say that I think the 2G service will continue to stay for a fairly long period of time. Um, it, it is an, it is a, not only an example in, uh, in 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 India, but it's an example in many many you know vastly developed countries where 2G service continue to be a very good and an optimized uh, way of uh, doing uh, some services like voice, VSM voice, but also for IoT and a few other things. And then the narrow band IoT services, it continues to be a very positive way of doing it. From our perspective, there is no uh, increased cost of 2D service. 2D service is there, it runs, and it's actually very, very effective. What we are doing is on the 3G side, uh, which is the, the service that we closed in the core, we are continuing to shut down 3G services in in, uh, in many markets. In fact, we have shut down 3G in, in, in about 30 cities across the country already, and we found the spectrum to use 4G services. And that will continue to happen. I don't expect the 2G services to be uh, um, continuing to, uh, to decline. But I don't expect to be shut down anytime soon. Then your last question was around postpaid. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure where the 10% number is coming from. Uh, there is a slight decline in, in postpaid, uh, but it's not a significant decline that has taken place in this quarter. We are starting to see positive traction in, um, in certainly in the postpaid business. Uh, machine to machine is, is, is actually after the pandemic, because during the pandemic, many of the services such as you know, people using for um, payment machines and so on, those services were either not being used or being disconnected. We're seeing a recovery of that, and we expect the postpaid business to continue to do well. We are not seeing uh, any that's a material decline or a back in that, uh, in that particular uh, part of the business. Sure, just a small follow up on the last one. So, 10% is the number which uh, I could derive year on year about two and a half million customer decline. Most of which, uh, which happened like uh, immediately after the pandemic, but uh, that number is not fully recovered because at that time it mentioned that that's because of M2M, but M2M should have uh, recovered by now. So just wanted to get some sense: is it uh, that uh, the like two to one million customer decline, decline which you've seen in postpaid for the last one year? Is it in the weaker circles or it's uh, broad based? So I mean, I can't, obviously this is not information that we share, uh, Kunal. What I can tell you is that if you look on quarter on quarter basis as you move forward, we are seeing uh, the decline to be uh, much, much more slower, right? And the in the in the every in a quarterly basis. And I can tell you that the 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 positive uh, momentum in in, in post is certainly back, and the machine to machine business is also very well recovered after the after the pandemic. I mean, these are the only details I can give you. Uh, without going into the exact numbers. And Kunal, if I may add, some of this uh, reduction which you see in postpaid is also migration from postpaid to prepaid because of the price arbitrage. Understood, understood. Just that like, uh, Adel is seeing a healthy addition in the last two quarters. So there's a disconnect between what you are seeing and uh, what Adel is seeing. So that's where the question is coming from. Yeah, no, Kunal, I think, I mean, we are, we are obviously, we're seeing a positive trend, uh, and, and we expect this positive trend to continue, I guess, is the, is the way to, to say. 
understood. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll take the next question from the line of Vivekanand S from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One, um, by when would you need to raise capital to meet your own March 22 4G coverage, uh, population coverage target of 1.15 billion? Also, if you could help us with your present 4G coverage in the priority circles, uh, you had said that it was 83% in March 20. and and you have targeted that to go up to 90% second question is on the recent uh, weekend rollover that you you uh, announced the weekend data rollover isn't that this at odds with the tariff hike plans that you may have given that uh, this seems dilutive to the tariff hike narrative uh, Uh, as far as the 4G customer base goes and thirdly the gap between your reported arpu and computed arpu uh, that continues to widen so uh, i know that your uh, the reported arpu is computed on services revenue and excludes infrastructure fixed line and device revenues but the uh, i mean this gap seems to be widening now when when i multiply the reported arpu uh, by three times the average customer base and when i compare it with the reported revenue number that gap has increased could you help us understand that better thank you okay thank you wait let me take some of them and i'll i'll, I'll uh, pass a couple of them over to uh, to akshay um i think in in regards to the uh, the capital is itself and so we are uh, you know fairly well advanced and, and well underway uh, we don't really expect any uh, changes to our targets that we had set for march 22 in terms of our uh, coverage and so on based on where we are in the uh, in the fundraising process so no no significant uh, change at this point we don't see the bias something that will Either get delayed or modified uh, compared to the, uh, the the numbers that we had shared earlier. Um, on the uh, for the uh, priority circles, uh, uh, clearly part of the going from 83% to 90%, 90% is um, you know part of the fundraising process was that we will use that money to focus on uh, on on continuing to increase our coverage in those circles. I can tell you that we, you know, we've added a significant amount of capacity in those circles, and and we continue to enjoy uh, because of the quality of network. Uh, we continue to enjoy um, a great experience uh, for our customers in that uh, um, in those circles. I would say today our focus is very much on maintaining capacity and providing a great experience. Our uh, increase in coverage in those circles will come alongside with the funding that uh, that will happen. So we are. Not significantly different than the number that we had uh, shared with you earlier in regards to our, um, our population coverage in those uh, four G priority circles. And I think your next question was around uh, the weekend uh, rollover. Uh, no, I don't believe that that is an arms at all. I think there's a great uh, a way in which uh, the customers who get to let's say not necessarily use uh, this data. They might have purchased to do the time that it's made that's made it available to them. I think what is what is actually uh, what we are trying to sort of go towards, which makes much more sense in our minds, is that customers buy a certain amount of uh, data, and they should be allowed to use that certain amount of data within the time frame that they purchase it for. Actually, the concept of creating this daily limit by itself. Uh, which was created by some of our competitors actually is in my view flawed, and it's not the right way. So I think in some ways it is starting to change for the for the small way the industry and eventually get to the right place, which is people buy a certain amount of data, customers buy a certain amount of data, they get to use it whenever they wish to use it, as opposed to if you don't use it today, it gets, um, let's say, uh, you know, you don't use it, but you lose it. Uh, that's really not the right way. So if you buy. A data pack for 28 days, you should be able to use it for 28 days. So I don't think it is a part of the tariff pack at all. I think it is providing uh, an experience to the customers and 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 actually meeting their needs, especially after they have purchased um, the um, the plan that they have uh, they have purchased. 
Now, on the fourth part, Akshay, I pass it over to you for the reported versus the computed outcomes. So thanks, Surinder. Vivek, actually, you see, reported ARPU is the correct consumer ARPU. If the divergence is happening as you are calculating, it is because maybe the other streams of revenue, other than the consumer revenue, are going faster. That's the only reason. Now, there could be some finer impacts because uh, the ARPU, I mean, if you use to calculate the derived revenue based on ARPU and number of end of period subs, uh, there may be some difference based on the average sub, but largely it shows that the enterprise revenue is growing at a faster rate than the consumer revenue. Uh, understood. Uh, this this is helpful. Uh, just a couple of small follow-ups, uh, data queries actually. Uh, would you be able to help us with how many 3G sites you, you are still running and the time frame that you are looking at for the shutdown of 3G services? Uh, and secondly, uh, in the consumer ARPU, how much is the uh, IUC related ARPU contribution um, that would help us because uh, you know from the fourth quarter we need to take that into account. So if I can answer the question as far as the ARPU question is concerned, generally interconnect is about 10% of our overall revenue, uh, not necessarily of the ARPU. So you can take that as a guideline. So of course uh, from the next quarter this revenue will go away cost will also go away. So that was the first part. I think in terms of 3G sites, I will not be able to share that data with you, but uh, the direction which we are taking is that 3G is not required uh, anymore. It is being continued only because some people have devices which can be used only on 3G and not on 4G. As and when in a given geography, uh, the subscribers are coming to a lower number, uh, then we are taking market interventions, following up with customers so that we can discontinue. Ideally, we should be done with our 3G closure in FY22, and our intention is to do it as fast as possible while keeping the consumer uh, requirements in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of PD from Lansdowne Investment. Please go ahead. Hi there. Good afternoon, and thanks for taking my question. Um, you know, I had a question around your fundraising plans. If you could please uh, share a more detailed update, uh, you know, on why is it taking so long to close? Because on the last quarter's call, I believe it was mentioned that it was expected to close in the coming quarter. And what are the reasons, uh, you know, why it is taking so long? especially given, given the high level of liquidity that we are seeing in global markets and even some of our competitors being able to raise funds uh, very quickly. And now what is the you know, expected timeline by when we can you know, hear some uh, closures on that aspect? Thank you. Okay, uh, PD, just to uh, clarify, I, first of all, I don't believe that this is taking an uh, inordinate amount of time. I mean, this is, uh, um, you know, it takes time to raise funds. I don't know um, how it can be compared to, um, you know, some of the other competitors who you say have raised funds faster because I'm not aware of their timelines of how quickly uh, they raise their, their funds. All I can tell you is that we are very well engaged. Uh, there is interest in in, uh, in in various you know participants uh, in in helping us with fundraising, um, and we are you know very well progressed. Now, when exactly? In fact, now I would shy away from giving you a date because uh, you know this is something that uh, uh, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. We are close. I I really don't think there's any uh, point in putting a date to it. Uh, we understand that this is important for us. Uh, clearly, as as we've shared also plans, we say that we are we are hoping that some of this funding will help us in the in in, in our capex as well as that of rollouts uh, that we need to do. Uh, but certainly, as the question was asked earlier, do we expect any changes in our um, you know, rollout plans based on our current fundraising where we are? And we said no to that. So hopefully, that gives you an idea of how quickly we will be able to raise it. But all I can say is that I don't believe that, the, that there's any inordinate delay. 
uh, and I don't believe that this is something that uh, is now it's still in its early stage. I think we are the, at a fairly well developed stage, and the and the demand continues to be very very positive. Okay, so there is clear interest from a set of investors. It is not a question of lack of interest uh, from uh, investors. That's okay. not a cause of concern. Uh, am I right? It's not a problem. No, no, no. If there is interest, uh, of course, until you get the money in the bank, it's all, uh, you know, interest and and so on. But I would, I can tell you, I can confirm with you that there is absolutely interest in uh, in in this investment and fundraising for our company. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Start from the line of Vikash from Sogjin. Please go ahead. Hello. I think I had the same question the previous session has covered, so I'm good with that. Okay, thank you, Vikash. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is on the line of Vishnu KG from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, just wanted to know, like, uh, I mean, sometime back we were looking at uh, monetizing our non-core assets like cyber, data center, and all. Could you please provide some color on where we are in the journey, or is it in the back burner for now? Thank you. No, I think Vishnu, our focus very much at this time is on fundraising. Um, I mean, as it's saying. Uh, our focus very much actually is on uh, improving and continue to have uh, good operational performance as well as um, engagement with the customers, which I talked about earlier. That's going well. And we're focused on our fundraising, uh, which also, uh, as I mentioned, is going well. So that's really our focus. I don't think we are at this point actively doing any of the non-core asset monetization discussions because I think they are. It's probably it's not the right time to do it. We have done some work on it earlier, uh, but frankly, it's a bit on the back burner now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanjay Jain from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. A uh, few questions from my side. Uh, uh, first, on the uh, digital uh, partnership we are running with uh, various partners, uh, just wanted to understand what kind of uh, uh, monthly GMV run rate are we in terms of uh, selling the product and services uh, 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 for our partners. That's the first question to understand. Uh, how deep and how strong the relationship we have with them. Uh, number two, on the uh, 5G side, we did uh, touch upon the uh, readiness, uh, but it looks like uh, one of your partner is now doing a trial run uh, based on dynamic spectrum sharing, uh, which we have earlier tried, uh, have been actively doing on the 4G side. How ready are we in terms of uh, uh, extending that service even for the 5G end? Uh, which are the spectrum band do you think uh, uh, we have enough uh, quantity uh, to uh, provide that service? Uh, number three, uh, more a data uh, point question. Uh, what is our uh, EBITDA contribution from uh, IUC uh, that would uh, get knocked off from next quarter? These are the three questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sanjay. And um, um, on the on the partnership side, um, I have to say that this is actually one of the very 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 exciting areas. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, we have actually built out several several uh, strategic partnerships in the in the last quarter. Um, the, the the three areas of focus that we've had initially is really on uh, learning and upskilling, health and wellness, and then on business health, which I think are all very uh, important areas, especially given the current pandemic situation and where the economic uh, you know situation is, because people are looking for learning and upskilling, and, and of course health is is a, is a very critical area. And businesses who have struggled through this pandemic are looking for help and learn how they get to the digitalization part. And I gave you an example of several uh, partners where we have done uh, uh, work in terms of bringing them on board. Our approach to uh, partnership, um, you know, just to be clear, Sanjay is very different. What we are trying to do is to do what we call deep integration, 
which means that in some ways the benefit of us and the partner coming together is better than and more important than just us being a potentially reseller of this service. And sometimes those deep integration, depending on the services, you know, involve more than just us, you know, becoming a reseller. It could involve could be authentication, could be you know other ways in which we integrate the service together. So those things are, are actually quite exciting and, and doing really well. What I cannot give you, and I don't think we provide this data, and it's certainly it's early days anyway, is to give you the GMB as you talked about. Uh, but I can certainly tell you that the response from the market and our customers have been positive. Uh, but you know, it's too early at this point, and it's not something that we disclose anyway. Uh, I'm not even sure if we have the authorization to disclose from our partners exactly the value. Uh, but the 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 categories of partnerships are very exciting and they are seeing good traction and it's really the right time given what's happening in the in the country at this time anyway in regards to the 5g readiness we have always said that we are our, our network is 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 very much 5g ready we are the newest 4g network in the country uh, and as a part of our deployment we have continued to deploy 5g ready technologies I think it's something that's interesting that you know one of the competitors is showing DSR in a lab environment, whereas we have been running it practically on thousands of sites uh, in a production environment for a very long period of time. So I'm not really sure what the purpose of showing that is, but you know we have been doing this thing. It's running. It's in production. Uh, the technology is the same. Whether you use it for 4G spectrum or 5G spectrum, it doesn't really matter. Spectrum is spectrum, but it works. So we expect that to, uh, um, to actually be the most well tested and best, best, you know, most tuned in our network. And certainly, uh, you know, when the time is right for 5G, we expect to be in the best position to take advantage of that. Otherwise, we've not just done DSR, we've done massive micro, we've done, you know, clarification of the core, we've done you know, other elements that we've also brought in, which are all, in our view, are very well tested. We have spectrum in, in 900, 1800, 2500 band as well, both in the short, you know, TDD and FTD, and all of those uh, places, uh, um, GSR can be can be used. Um, on the EBITDA uh, contribution, Akshay, over to you for the, yeah. for the last question. Yes, yeah, Sanjay, the EBITDA contribution, which will go in the next quarter, is about 80 crores on account of interconnect going in. So 80 crores is a quarterly hitch because of uh, interconnect uh, getting That's discontinued. True. That's true. Yeah, just one uh, follow-up from uh, my earlier 5G question. Uh, so when we say uh, DSR, uh, and now that we are closing uh, 3G uh, so that it's dedicated 4G, but uh, and luckily uh, 5G is evolving very strong on 25 megahertz. We have the spectrum over there. Uh, do you think that combination of 1800 and uh, 2500 puts you in a better place for 5G in terms of uh, 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 readiness for the 5G services? And uh, when we say uh, dynamic spectrum, what kind of uh, actually cost is involved uh, in transforming the network uh, from being a, a standalone 4G to a more uh, dynamic spectrum? Uh, the 3G, 4G was more a part of transformation and uh, merger, this would be more of a uh, network upgradation. So I think it will involve an incremental cost. So what kind of uh, cost, a ballpark number, or even a directionally will be very helpful. Thank you. So, um, uh, so I mean, in terms of, uh, first of all, um, in usage of spectrum, that's the idea is that we are currently, we have already deployed DSR and we are currently using it. Uh, within the networks, it's mostly being used between 1800 and 900 right now, um, and and uh, but there's no reason why it cannot be extended to 2500 as well. Uh, the the network is already ready. Uh, it's a matter of then switching on the software element, uh, depending on the number of sites that we want to uh, to turn that on. And so there's no for us uh, the the given the fact that the network is ready, it's a matter of only software upgrades that need to happen. I'm sorry, but I can't give you the cost uh, one because I'm not sure if I'm, I'm allowed to disclose it. And honestly, I couldn't give you that off the top of my head anyway. So maybe we can have a discussion offline, Sanjay. I think that there is something that is interesting to you, but I certainly can't give you that number uh, on this call. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks for the time and thanks for the opportunity and best wishes. Sure, thank you. Thank you.
The next question is from the line of Gopala Krishna from HNI Investments. Please go ahead. Mr. Krishna, your line is in the talk mode. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, actually, uh, what I would like to uh, request uh, investment is that uh, every quarter, there's uh, depreciation and amortization. This around 6,600 crores per quarter is being taken out. Uh, and whereas the capex is very, very less, uh, it's uh, around 1,000 crores. So this, uh, I think this should give you uh, the word of an idea, the enough cash cushioning, so that uh, do you really need the funding? Uh, for the network upgrade this is my question and uh, and the next question is uh, like the subscriber this is very good to know that in the december month of december it appears that uh, we have gained the customers instead of losing the customers is this trend continuing in january as well uh, that's all from my side thank you so Ravinder, if i may just take the yeah. first question and then you can address the second one so I think, uh, uh, Paul Krishna, the comparison which you're making between depreciation and capex is generally applied in a situation whereby the DNA is taken as a set of setting aside of profit so that it does not get distributed to shareholders, which is a very different concept. Here we are talking about what is the requirement of the business to grow, and the funding requirement is that. Uh, it has really nothing in our context to do with depreciation and amortization. And uh, Ravinder, over to you for the second question, if there was something. Yeah, so uh, Gopal Krishna, on the, um, on the, on the question about subscriber, as I mentioned earlier, I think we are seeing a very positive uh, trend on uh, subscribers in all metrics, whether it's gross or production in uh, Insure uh, net additions, especially actually we're seeing strong on, on 4D and VR. Uh, so all of those areas are going well, and I think the trends are all positive. I can't give you a number, obviously, on January, given that we're talking about Q3 results. But I would say that we are we are seeing very improved uh, traction in each of these areas, uh, subscriber numbers, in general, on all on, on key metrics. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's just a follow-up question. Uh, I, I, I know that a particular number cannot be given. Just a small uh, question is, uh, in January, did we stop losing the customers? I don't think uh, I can answer that question, given the forward-looking nature of that. And it's just not something that we disclose on a month-on-month -month basis in any case. Okay, thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and I wish you good luck for, to be the number one operator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Paras from PTC. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for allowing me to ask the question. Yeah, this is regarding what ARP we are likely to target for the next quarter. Thank you. Sorry, Paras, I didn't catch that. Could you please repeat? This is regarding what ARP we are likely to target for the next quarter. You talk about RP, RP, RPs? Yes, ARP. Okay. Yes. Yeah, RP. Um, again, I don't think we we disclosed that uh, uh, that number, especially on uh, you know forward looking. Uh, we have seen now uh, that on quarter and quarter basis, this quarter as well as last quarter, we have seen that improvement. Um, and obviously, uh, we hope that trend continues, but uh, this is not something that we provide guidance on uh, on a forward looking basis. I'm sure, you know, maybe you want to jump in there and confirm. Uh, no, I have nothing to add from my side. Okay, but looking at the CapEx saving, which we are doing, with, I think so, RPU will be increased at the greater extent, right? Uh, I mean, just to make the point that CAPEX is diverted towards or is meant to either expand the coverage or capacity, uh, which is essentially meant that we can either take more subscribers, which may not result in improvement in our food, but if it is directed towards creating capacity so that the subscriber can use more, that can result in a higher output. So it can have both things. Um, as we have said, I think, earlier also that currently we have a very good capacity position. Uh, which is reflected in the customer experience, uh, which is reported by third parties. So really speaking, 
at this point of time, CAPEX is not a factor immediately, uh, which is impacting the ARPU. Uh, we have sufficient capacity to increase the traffic on our existing network uh, to improve the ARPU, so that is the question. Yes, thank you very much. That's all my topic. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is from the line of Sanjay Jain from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking up the follow-up question. Uh, one, one last thing I wanted to touch upon is the U broadband. bank. Uh, we have seen competition adding a strong subscriber base. So uh, understand we don't uh, you know, disclose a lot of information over that, but we can just highlight what kind of customer we are seeing, what kind of a group, and uh, what is an RP we are looking at, uh, U broadband, and what are the plans uh, around U broadband for us? Actually, I don't think we disclose any information, but we may wish to add. Yeah, Sandesh, so I think uh, we are not giving any separate disclosures for U broadband. Um, all that I can say is that I think in terms of our priority of investment, that is not a priority area. However, I think post the lockdown, we have seen some improvement happening in the performance of U broadband as the demand for these six line services has shown some improvement. Uh, got it, but uh, we are not disclosing even the subscriber number or what kind of app we are doing uh, in the U broadband as of now. Uh, not right now. Uh, I have heard you. Let's see what what we can do going forward. That has not been a focus area in terms of disclosure. Uh, but since you raised that question, we'll look at that and see what we can start doing from next quarter on. Thank you, Akshay. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vivekanand S from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Hello. Thank you for the follow-up opportunity. Is the entire rupees 128 billion current maturity of long-term debt payable over the next 12 months? Uh, it would be great if you can clarify how much leeway our existing lenders are giving us uh, since the industry continues to remain in an extraordinary state of uh, stress and low tariffs. So I think, Vivek, just to be clear, the <clears throat> figure which you are talking about, which is the current maturities of debt, that has nothing to do with the vendor payable. That is all uh, financial institution. And as you would have seen in our disclosures, actually the debt which is falling due for payment over the next uh, 12 months is more like uh, 30 billion rupees. Uh, the balance amount is largely reclassification of debt, which has a longer maturity, but which is reclassified because there are some breach of uh, covenants uh, where waiver has not been given explicitly by the lender. So from an accounting perspective, it has to be reclassified to current maturity. However, uh, there is no uh, likely action from any of the lenders to force those maturity. So it is more an accounting reclassification than anything else. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pranav Shatriya from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I just have one question. Uh, in uh, uh, you know, when you're talking about 5G, you talked about uh, you know 5G ecosystem not being mature, and you will look at uh, uh, you know investing at a opportune time. Can you specify you know what would be the key factors? What uh, you will describe as a you know uh, that uh, opportune time is there. Uh, will that be something around uh, you know number of 5G handsets versus uh, the proportion in the total handset shipment or something like that? Uh, what parameters you look at it? Yeah, for us, there's multiple elements to the ecosystem, uh, right? So one, of course, is the actual uh, network and the capabilities in the in the network itself. Many of those capabilities already exist, and as I said, we have deployed actually many of them, and they're in some cases already working within the 4G uh, spectrum bands uh, for us. Then, of course, and, and of course, it has been deployed across the world as well. And of course, there is the device ecosystem. I think this uh, certainly for India is very, very important. 
uh, given uh, not only the price sensitivity of the devices themselves, but also the price, uh, uh, you know, price sensitivity as well as the volumes that come. In India, of course, you know, when any any service gets picked up at a large mass market, you need you know many many devices at a very very cheap prices. And while devices are coming and they're cheaper, it certainly is very far away from where today. Uh, for example, 4G devices and their availability uh, is concerned as well as pricing is concerned. So I think that certainly will play a very important goal. The other element, of course, is you need spectrum. Um, and, and while we can do many of the 5G technologies on existing spectrum bands that we have, but the larger quantity of spectrum to get the real wide band service, you uh, need uh, most likely in the, uh, in the 35 megahertz band. And that is... Um, Something that is uh, obviously not up for auction, and it's very expensive in our view. Uh, from where we are um, in terms of the pricing, but we believe is the right pricing. So obviously, that is part of the ecosystem that has to uh, to develop as well. And then the last thing is um, when you say the ecosystem, it has to be set of services and use cases for which 5G is needed and 5G is required. Let's put it this way, and it cannot be done on existing. Um, you know, technologies, uh, so to say. And I think those are another area where there continues to be a uh, lack of clarity and, and lack of use cases, which are, I would say, coming out clearly to say that these use cases require 5G uh, technology and 5G spectrum. Um, and those are not there worldwide as well. We're seeing that the biggest use case for 5G tends to be on adding capacity. So if you have capacity on 4G sites which are congested and you want to add more capacity, sometimes 5G spectrum uh, is, is, uh, is you know, cheaper to add. Uh, given the amount of spectrum that we have and, and certainly is available in the upcoming option, we don't see again that as being a big problem uh, in the Indian context right now. So hopefully that gives you an answer to your question. Uh, for yeah, it does give me an answer, but I mean, you know, the, especially the if I just probe in a bit on the last point, uh, you talked about, you know, that the, the, the application ecosystem or the use case is not being ready. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, for whatever reason, that has been the case globally. And, uh, you know, still the companies have tended to add on to, you know, or rather hop on to the 5G bandwagon. So uh, do you think that at some point of time you will be forced to get into it because uh, the competition has already got into it? Uh, can can that be also a reason or a part of the ecosystem equation? Um, it's very difficult to answer that question because we don't know what, what will happen in regards to what happens in the market and what competition does. What I am telling you is that from where we sit today and what I see as the ecosystem and what I see in the industry, the, the use cases and the ecosystem of 5G development in India is still a bit away. So I think what you hear and what you see today is more, uh, and let's say, um, talking points and, and to some extent, uh, you know, um, uh, it's more to, to something to talk about rather than actually real use, use cases. We don't see any of those developments. As I said, we have technology and have been around and deployed for a very long period of time. Uh, in our network, certainly many of these things running for a year, uh, but without the ecosystem, those are, are are irrelevant, and we continue to use them on 4G anyway. So I think it's it's uh, it's very difficult to say what competition, of course, will do and how it will go. In many cases in the world where it has been deployed, there has been mostly to add capacity when 5G has 4G has uh, become congested, and there I think there is clearly a use case which is being deployed. Um, in in uh, in several countries. Uh, sure, I'll I'll just take one last question. Uh, one key component of uh, the 5G is uh, probably it's not really necessarily 5G, but you know one thing which clearly coming out is uh, RAN virtualization, uh, and that clearly I mean although you know you might be ready on the core or the transport side, the RAN virtualization is not what uh, you know everyone has has done. What are the pushes and pulls uh, when you are implementing a virtualized RAN solution uh, in either a 4G or a 5G environment in terms of the CapEx, basically? Pranav, it's a, it's a very uh, um, complex and a, and, a, and a detailed question. Uh, would I request that we potentially take this offline because it's not something that I, I don't want to give you an answer which is not very clear and, it's, and, and what you're asking I know. 
is quite a complicated uh, question in terms of the detail because it's not a straightforward answer to that uh, to that question. Sure, no problem. Uh, uh, very very useful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the last question. I now have the conference over to Mr. Ravindar Takkar for his closing comments. Um, thank you, Lizanne, um, and, and thank you all for your, uh, for your questions. So to conclude, um, I would say our strong focus on becoming the best 4G network in the country is yielding results which are reflected in not only the top rankings that we've received from several third-party reports, uh, we are also starting to witness healthy trends across several subscriber metrics with improving subscriber retention and good traction on our 4G and UL additions. We are making progress on our strategy. Our cost optimization efforts have already started to yield significant output saving. Our additional fundraising process will help us achieve our strategic intent and that continues to be put on our way. And hopefully it will create a very strong competitive position for us in the market. Once again, I thank you, thank you all for taking the time to join us for this call, and I look forward to talking to you and many of you offline as well. Thank you very much.